Welcome to Star Wars Transmissions, I'm Dan. On January 5th, 2021, Star Wars fans were thrusted into a brand new era of galactic history known as the High Republic. This era in the Star Wars timeline was a period of time that lasted for around 200 years between approximately 300 BBY and 82 BBY in which the Galactic Republic was said to be at its height, expanding its reaches into the Outer Rim territories. It was also a golden age for the Jedi, who were significantly more active throughout the galaxy. Each of the comics, novels, and stories that we've gotten on the High Republic have been so much fun, completely awesome, and have been a breath of fresh air. So, I thought it'd be fun to discuss some interesting facts about this golden era in galactic history. Let's take a look at 10 interesting facts of the High Republic. Spoilers ahead for Light of the Jedi, Into the Dark, The Rising Storm, and the High Republic comic series. Obviously, get them booty cheeks out of here if you don't want any spoilers. Number 1. The Jedi were kinda sorta allowed to have sex. During the days of the prequel era Jedi, having sex was definitely something that was frowned upon. Just ask our homeboy Anakin Skywalker. No! During the High Republic, however, that wasn't necessarily the case. Well, kinda. In the epilogue of the novel Light of the Jedi, it's alluded that Jedi Masters Elzar Mann and Avar Chris had a sexual relationship with each other while they were both Padawans. Furthermore, it's mentioned that such relationships were tolerated, understood, and common for Padawans, but things to be left behind once one ascended to become an adult in the Jedi Order. Moreover, in the novel The Rising Storm, we learn that Elzar Mann had sex with one of the Republic Fair's coordinators, named Samir era Ra'un, even if he seemed to regret it the following day. Additionally, in the novel Into the Dark, the Jedi Padawan Wreath Silas was asked by the pilot Afi Hollow if the Jedi have sex, to which he teetered on whether he should go into his master's explanation about the difference between celibacy of the body and true purity of the heart before opting not to. While the Jedi Order during the High Republic disapproved of both physical and emotional attachments, just like the Jedi of Anakin's time, their stance on the topic seemed to be far less hardlined and much more lax than that of the prequel era Jedi. Sex to the High Republic Jedi seemed to be something that the Order kinda turned a blind eye to. So yeah, the High Republic Jedi got down and dirty. Giggity, giggity, giggity. <laughs> The topic of sex has come up in several stories of the High Republic, which is definitely not a coincidence. It's one of the multitude of examples that helps highlight the differences between the Jedi Order of the High Republic and the Order during the years leading up to their near demise at the hands of the Sith. Sticking with the Jedi, number 2. Mind tricks were kinda frowned upon. First seen being used by Obi-Wan Kenobi on a stormtrooper in A New Hope, a mind trick was a force ability that allowed the practitioner to influence and control the thoughts, behavior, and actions of the affected individual, generally to the user's advantage. During the days leading up to the Clone Wars and after it, the mind trick was a force technique that was used frequently and without hesitation by the Jedi. During the High Republic era, however, that wasn't the case. Instead of being called a mind trick, the technique was commonly referred to as a mind touch, and it's implied that the mind touch was used far less often. There were some Jedi in the Order, such as Jedi Master Avar Chris, who preferred not to use such a technique, believing it was not entirely a light side ability since it stripped someone's agency from them and removed their ability to make decisions and do things on their own. Jedi such as Elzar Mann, on the other hand, believed that the mind trick, which is what he preferred to call it, was in fact a light side ability since the ability could be used for benevolent reasons. Over time, the mind trick eventually became a more accepted and and common technique used by Jedi in the years leading up to the Clone Wars and after it, which is just another example of how the Jedi of the High Republic and the Jedi of the prequels differed. Number 3. Lina So's great works were pretty great. One of the High Republic's most important figures was Supreme Chancellor Lina So. She was elected into the role of Supreme Chancellor prior to the Great Hyperspace Disaster in 232 BBY, which saw several fragments of the legacy-run freighter emerge out of hyperspace and collide with various planets and moons. As Supreme Chancellor, So oversaw a period of Republic expansion into the galactic frontier of the Outer Rim. In doing so, the Republic's expansion was reinforced by her ideologies of unity and a peaceful coexistence for all of the Republic member worlds. To help achieve this, So established what she called her Great Works, which were a group of outreach projects and programs undertaken by the Galactic Republic. This included several technological innovations, the opening of the Republic Fair on Valo, negotiations for a treaty between the Quarren and Mon Calamari on the planet Moncala, as well as the creation and dedication of the Starlight Beacon Space Station. While on the subject of Starlight Beacon, number 
before. It's one wild-ass space station. One of the biggest events to shape the High Republic was the construction and opening of Starlight Beacon in the Outer Rim Territories. Also known as the Starlight Station, Starlight Beacon was launched in 232 BBY following the events of the Great Hyperspace Disaster in order to expand the Republic's domain to the unexplored dark zones of the Outer Rim Territories. The space station was designed to serve a myriad of purposes, aiming to attend to the diverse needs of the people and planets of the Outer Rim. Because areas like the Outer Rim were dangerous and hard to navigate during the High Republic, one of Starlight Beacon's primary functions, as its name suggests, was to act as a beacon, sending out a signal that guided travelers from other parts of the galaxy who ventured into the Outer Rim territories. Additionally, because communication across the galaxy was more difficult during this time, Starlight Beacon sought to remedy that issue, serving as a massive relay point to facilitate better, faster communications among the peoples of the Outer Rim. Another function of the beacon was also to serve as neutral ground upon which disputing worlds could negotiate a potential peace. Or, if the dispute turned heated and there was a threat of war breaking out, the beacon was a military base, with a strong contingent of peacekeepers staffed on a rotating basis from the worlds of the Republic Defense Coalition, which was the defense organization of the Galactic Republic. The Jedi also had a presence on the beacon, which housed the largest Jedi temple outside Coruscant to serve as a hub for the Order's activities in the Outer Rim and beyond. The Starlight Temple provided everything younglings, Padawans, Jedi Knights, and Jedi Masters might need to serve the citizens of the Outer Rim and the Force. Aside from hosting a large contingent of Jedi, Starlight Beacon was also a hospital, an observatory, a research station, a bustling market, trading in goods from across the Outer Rim and beyond, as well as a cultural center. Because the beacon was open to all the citizens of the Republic, it was built to allow every galactic citizen to experience the Republic in all its grand diversity, housing modules that demonstrated the flora and fauna of various Republic worlds, with the exhibits constantly changing to provide a truly representative experience of the Galactic Republic. Since Starlight Beacon was built to serve a myriad of purposes, the space station wound up being quite large, and its creation taxed even the limitless resources of the Republic at that time, which caused its construction to cost a great expense and effort. Number 5. The Introduction of Jedi Wayseekers One of the most interesting things that have come out of the High Republic is the introduction of Jedi Wayseekers into canon. Wayseeker was a title of the Jedi Order that signified a Jedi who wished to operate independently of the Jedi High Council and its dictates. Although a Wayseeker operated independently from the Jedi Order, they were still a Jedi Knight within the Order. This meant that they were free to let the Force guide them in choosing their path and missions. There were Wayseekers that had been known to undergo solitary missions meditation on mountaintops and assist revolutionaries against planetary tyrants. In one memorable case, a Jedi Wayseeker actually became a minor singing sensation on Alderaan. The Umbaran female Jedi Master, Orla Jarini, was a Jedi who declared herself to be a Wayseeker during the High Republic era. She felt that certain decisions of the Jedi High Council were wrong and that she should be allowed to fully trust in her own feelings and the Force. As a result of this, she anointed herself as a Wayseeker and sought to leave the core to instead travel to the Outer Rim and assist frontier planets dealing with issues such as the Drengear and the Nile. Speaking of the Nile, number 6. The Nile's use of path engines made them a unique and serious threat. One of the biggest threats to the galaxy during the High Republic was the Nile. Based in the Outer Rim territories, this group of marauders caused havoc and spread terror and fear throughout the galaxy and the Outer Rim. One of the things that made the Nile such a threat was their use of path engines. Path engines were a type of specialized hyper drive that provided incredibly fast hyperspace travel through the use of unorthodox and otherwise inaccessible paths. Paths were unlike regular hyperspace routes in that they were impossible according to conventional navigation systems. Path engines allowed the Nile to appear unexpectedly when undertaking raids, giving the marauders a feared reputation. These devices were installed on Nile starships in addition to normal hyperdrives connected to the vessel's engines. Path engines then translated the paths into navigational data, allowing Nile starships to travel through routes that would otherwise be impossible to navigate. They even allowed the Nile to jump in and out of hyperspace in a planet's atmosphere, something that was incredibly dangerous and essentially only done by the Nile. Path engines, as well as the paths that the Nile utilized, were originally provided to the Nile by Asgar Ro after he positioned himself as the first Eye of the Nile. Upon his death, his son, Markion Ro, took his place. As Eye of the Nile, both Asgar and Markion Ro were placed in charge of protecting, discovering and distributing paths to the Nile as they wrought havoc across the Outer Rim territories. Number 7. The Jedi used starfighters that required a lightsaber key. 
During the days of the High Republic, the Jedi Order utilized a very interesting starfighter called a Vector. Designed to be a physical extension of the Jedi's connection to the Force, as the Jedi would use the Force to assist in piloting the starship, the Vector was a sleek and streamlined vessel that emphasized performance and maneuverability. They could be configured to carry either one or two occupants, providing the Jedi the opportunity to fly either alone or with their Padawans. Vectors were capable of responding quickly to their Force-sensitive pilots, which allowed Jedi to achieve maneuvers that might otherwise be impossible with different starfighters. The starfighters had minimal shielding, almost no weaponry, and very little computer assistance. The capabilities of the spacecraft were defined by their Jedi pilots, and as such, it was believed that the Jedi were the shielding, the weaponry, and the minds that calculated what the vectors could achieve and where it could go. Furthermore, when a cohort of Jedi vectors were flocked together, they were able to connect with each other through the Force, allowing them to move together and in unison, weaving and moving past each other at incredible speeds, something that was referred to as a drift. One of the most interesting aspects of Vectors were their weapons system, which had safeguards in place to minimize the lethality of the starfighters. The weapons on Vectors could only be operated with a lightsaber key, a way to ensure that they were not used by non-Jedi, and that every time they were used, it was a well-considered action. Once the lightsaber unlocked the weapons display, the color of the display matched the color of the lightsaber's blade that it was linked with. Additionally, the ship's lasers could be scaled up or down via a toggle on the control sticks, which meant not every shot had to be a kill. This allowed the Jedi to disable or even warn a combatant or enemy so as to not kill any beings unless it was an absolute last resort, ensuring that the Jedi had every opportunity available to them for handling a situation or an adversary. Number 8. Bacta was discovered during this era. Of the many wonders seen during the days of the High Republic, few had an impact upon the galaxy the way that Bacta did. Considered as a new miracle drug, Bacta came into use during the High Republic era as a replacement for Juvan, a medicinal substance also used for healing during the High Republic. Invented by the Vratix, an insectoid species from Thyphera, and manufactured by two companies, Zoltan Core and Zuckfra Core, Bacta was a thick, gelatinous substance with seemingly magical healing properties that helped the body regrow tissue, including nerves, skin, and muscles. It was a mixture of CAVAM and Alizee bacteria combined with Ambori fluid and a type of barley known as Vertixia renanicus, also known as Vertixian barley. Because Bacta promoted rapid regeneration of organic compounds, it could be used in a variety of both critical and non-critical medical situations. It was described as being warm to the touch and Bacta liquid could aid in the healing of trauma to the head, internal organs, and broken bones. Furthermore, it could be placed in small dishes to mend cuts, burns, and other injuries, and could even help regrow fingernails. Due to its one-size-fits-all use in medical applications, it was a highly prized and commonly used medical treatment for most, if not all, injuries. The agri-world Hetzel Prime attempted to grow Bacta during the High Republic, but their Bacta facility could only produce the drug in limited quantities. In 232 BBY, the Hutt Cartel provided protection to an independent colony on the planet Cedri Minor in return for for regular payments of Vertixia barley, which the colony grew, bringing us to our next interesting fact, number 9. The Huts and Jedi were allies for a time. In 232 BBY, while investigating an attack on a starship in the Kaslan system, several Jedi Masters and Knights traveled to the independent colony on Cedri Minor to see if they could find any clues regarding the destroyed starship in the Kaslan system. Once the Jedi arrived on Cedri Minor and began to speak with the planet's natives, several of the Jedi were captured by the evil Drengir, which were a plant-like species of sentient, amorphous carnivores from the wild space planet of Mulita. As the Jedi fought the Drengir, an armored hut known as Myarga the Benevolent or Myarga the Merciless appeared on the planet declaring that Cedri Minor was the property of the Hut Cartel, as the Huts protected Cedri in exchange for Vertixian Barley. The Hut and her mercenaries soon attacked the Jedi, resulting in a battle between the two forces. As this occurred, the Drengir began to appear across the entire galaxy, infecting planets and wreaking immense havoc galaxy-wide. Jedi Master Avar Chris, who was fighting Myarga, soon learned that distress calls from a multitude of Republic planets infected with a Drengir inundated the Jedi and Starlight Beacon. Hoping to persuade Myarga that the fight between the Jedi and the Huts was insignificant compared to the threat of the Drengir, Avar Chris had the distress calls from Starlight Beacon sent directly to her comlink, allowing Myarga to hear the carnage wrought across the galaxy by the Drengir. To Myarga's shock, some of the calls the Jedi were receiving were from the Hut species homeworld of Nalhada. Once Myarga understood that the entire galactic 
galactic frontier was under attack and that neither the Jedi nor Huts could stop them on their own, Myerga then agreed to an alliance with the Jedi to fight against the Drengir. Although members of the Jedi Order and the Republic Senate did not fully approve of Avar Chris's decision to form an alliance with the Hut Cartel, the partnership between the two factions allowed the Jedi to stand a fighting chance against the Drengir threat, as their forces were already stretched thin, combating the Nile across the Outer Rim. And finally, last but certainly not least, number 10. The High Republic introduced us to the king and party man himself, Geode. The High Republic novel Into the Dark introduced Star Wars fans to my number one homeboy, the wild party animal Geode. Hailing from the planet Vint, Geode was a Vintian male who acted as the navigator of the transport starship vessel alongside the human pilots Leox Giazzi and Afi Hollow during the High Republic era. At this time, my homeboy's date of birth is unknown, but we know he was born sometime before the events of Into the Dark, which took place in 232 BBY. As his name suggests, Geode's appearance resembled a tall, dark gray, flinty and flaky rock, so our boy was basically a rock slab. According to Geode's co-pilot, Leox, Geode's true name could only be pronounced by those without a mouth. At some point prior to 232 BBY, Geode joined the Bind Guild, which was a guild of star pilots and navigators, and soon began to work with Leox and Affy on a regular basis, acting as a navigator for the vessel. According to Affy, Geode was typically shy before he got to know a being, whereas Leox described Geode as a wild man, except except when it came to the business of navigation. At one point, while the trio were on Coruscant, Leox informed Avi that Geode was out hitting the clubs, that he had no idea as to when the Vintian would return to the vessel, and that Geode was gonna have to slow down one day. Party man, our boy most certainly was. In 232 BBY, Geode, Leox, and Afi helped several Jedi, including Padawan Wreath Silas and the Wayseeker Orla Jarini, with combating the Drengear and Nile on an abandoned Amaxine space station, and even assisted Orla Jarini in the purchase of her starship Lightseeker. Months later, while providing transport to several Jedi sent to Nalhada on a secret mission, Geode assisted in fighting off Jabba the Hutt's thugs that had attempted to hold all aboard the vessel hostage. And there you have it. Those are 10 interesting facts about the High Republic. Diving into this new era of Star Wars has been a ton of fun thus far. There's still a ton of High Republic stories that will be released in the coming months and years, and I can't freaking wait to read them all. But what do you guys think about some of the facts we've discussed? What are some of your favorite High Republic facts or moments? Let me know down in the comments. If you like this video, please help out the channel by hitting that like button and making sure you subscribe. Follow the channel on Instagram, Twitter, Twitter and Facebook all at SW Transmissions. Thanks for watching and stay nerdy.